evening students before we be, uh, begin today's learning can somebody tell me the status of uh, last class homework I have given you this question to find the stabilities of uh, various ions formed by the gain or loss of electron in oxygen molecule. Have you solved this question? Good evening, Mom. Good evening. Good evening, students. Here you can see the homework which I gave to you in the last class is displayed on the screen. And as in the last class, all of you said that you have your exams, uh, maybe test or exams or whatever subject you were having. So I thought let's wait for another way, uh, another say four or five days, and before the next class we'll have, mm. right? So have you done it, uh, Ritika, Shweta, or and other students? Uh, can you write it at your own right now? I can give you two minutes, else we should be uh, going on to the next topic. Take two minutes and quickly write the electronic configuration of these uh, five species. Ma'am, is it um, O2, 2 plus first, and then O2 plus, O2, O2 minus, and O2, 2 minus? Uh, Shweta, have you solved this question? I tried doing it last class. Okay. So for, this is the yeah. For O two two plus um the it will be like three, and for O two plus it will be two point five. Yeah. So I understood uh, that you have solved it. See, basically the purpose of putting up this question is in the last class also I said to you that we basically ask the question based on N2 plus 1 or N N2 related ions or O2 related ions. All sorts of a thing relating to uh, drawing the energy level diagram, finding the magnetic behavior, bond length and stability. Everything can be asked. Right? So just please be uh, more focused on it and uh, I'm just asking a question which you feel is not uh, so relevant to you as of moment. Have you heard about uh, any news of class 12th paper? Or the sample paper being uh, shared by CBSC again? Any idea, Ritika and Shweta? Okay, I'll tell you one thing. That CBSC has recent on 8th of September have uh, given you another set of sample paper to be followed in 20 uh, in the next year exams that is 2024 and you people will be appearing in 2025. They have taken NEP pretty seriously. All the questions as I tell you none of the question my analysis of both the samples one sample they shared in the month of April 
this year and this one this as i told you has they have shared on 8th of september right none of the question is direct like somebody is asking you to tell me what is a paramagnetic and what is the diamagnetic behavior they haven't done so right what they have done they have just given the application based questions and there is before we start the next chapter i'll show you there are at least two questions which even a class 11th student if they study regularly and uh, pay importance to the basic concepts and solve the all the ncrt questions there should be no issues in having 95 plus percent marks in class 12th exam as well as the class 11th so again to begin the class with my sincere advice to all dear students is that please pay focus or please stay focused or attentive for the basic concepts and do the practice while writing right um, i understand that in the times of covid we have lost that habit of writing we are more into the mcq mode right but let's change our good old habits this is uh, we were doing in the last class we were talking about the hydrogen bonding we have understood that hydrogen bonding is of two types intermolecular and intramolecular just to be in the class can ratika explain me the differences between inter and intramolecular hydrogen bonding Shweta, can you describe inter and intramolecular hydrogen bonding? Um, in one second. Intramolecular yeah. is like within the same element, and intramolecular is with like other elements. Ah, uh, it's quite. Let's recall quickly. see uh, let's understand what is hydrogen bond how it appeared what happened and all those things in a quick two minute uh, or a five minute thing that hydrogen bond is an attractive force which is formed between the elements having high electronegativity such as nitrogen oxygen and fluorine right and the best condition or the only condition for them to form hydrogen bond is that they must be having hydrogen atom attached to nitrogen oxygen and fluorine right so they form hydrogen bonds now hydrogen bond is merely or only a attractive force right that exists between the different molecules moving further we can say that it is of two types one is called as intermolecular and another one is called as intramolecular i tried to tell you the with the example that what is the meaning of inter and intra for your reference we said inter means in between two so the type of hydrogen bonding which is happening between two different molecules atoms should be belonging to two different molecule is called as intermolecular hydrogen bonding and intra will be within the same molecule right so that is a quick recall what is a intermolecular and what is intramolecular hydrogen bonding here and in the last class we discussed ammonia we discussed water we discussed hf to begin with right you can draw it in the straight line as well as in the zigzag fashion as you can see here that means hf one molecule hf another molecule hf another molecule you can draw hydrogen bond lines in the straight line also right bond angles the zigzag lines and the straight lines bother us or we become more important for us when we talk about chemical bonding in terms of specifically hydro, uh, hybridization right so in the last class we were discussing what will be the or what are the impacts of hydrogen bonding the first and the most important 
impact of hydrogen bonding was it increases the solubility and the other is the boiling point. This, believe me, is going to be very important for the class 12th, class 12th also. So we need to figure it out, all the four things which are written here. Probably uh, you will not be able to understand the last point on the screen because for that we need to know the nitty gritty of organic chemistry which we have not done as yet. Now coming to the first point, we will take this one first and I'll explain it to you what we have to write and what is expected from you. The first point says, so before that I will just put it down that hydrogen bonds affect or impact basically two properties. One is the boiling point and other one is the solubility. Now come, uh, come to the first, what is written on the screen. It is saying boiling point of water is, and the third thing of course we can write it down. At times it happens, but most of the time it may not happen. We are talking about the physical state. Right? There are two points uh, in the same statement that boiling point of water is more than <clears throat> the boiling point of H2S. Now, can you define boiling point for us? What is the definition of boiling point? Have you been taught about what is the def uh, definition of a boiling point or boiling process in class 10? I'm seeking this uh, clarity from, uh, from the students because many or such sections are uh, now discarded from class 10 syllabus. So to me, you should have been taught about what is a boiling point. But if you are not taught, then uh, Shweta, let me know what is the status. They have talked about it. Like uh, yeah, but, how it wait, uh, like how are you asking like in detail or just like boiling point? No, what is the process of boiling? How do we say that boiling point of water is 100 degree? The process and what is happening at the molecular level. Any idea about it? I don't think so. Okay, let me explain it to you. Uh, and again, boiling point is a very key concept for the class 11th as well as class 12th because it is going to change the properties of many such things, right? For class 12th, there is a chapter called as Solutions, the chapter 1 of book 1. It is correlated. So let us understand what is the process of boiling or what happens when we boil a liquid. Let's see, we have a container filled with a liquid which can be say water or anything now when we are boiling it what is happening let us understand it the mic at the micro as well as the macro level when we are heating what is happening heat supplied will increase the energy of uh, constituent particles or we can say molecules so uh, as a result what will happen they will start moving quickly or in a faster mode They will start moving at faster rate, right? So what will happen? Some of the particles which were initially at this bottom, they will move towards the surface, right? And as a result, when they reach surface, 
they will start exerting pressure on the inner molecules. These particles which have reached the surface will start exerting pressure on the inner particles. At the same time, the container is always somewhat empty. Even if you fill it to the brim, there will always be atmosphere around it. That means some of the particles of water will there be or any liquid will be there in the atmosphere. Right? These are present in atmosphere. So what they will do? They will also start exerting pressure on the liquid. So what we mean to say by this? We mean to say that when you are boiling a liquid, there will be a pressure from the above as well as from the bottom. Right? The pressure above is because of our atmosphere and this one is called as atmospheric pressure. Right? And the other type of a pressure which we are talking about is known as vapor pressure. Vapor pressure will be the pressure or is the pressure which is exerted by the vapors of liquid. Right? When vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure, we say the liquid is boiling. So what is boiling point? Boiling point is a temperature at which atmospheric pressure is equal to vapor pressure. Is it clear to all of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And please remember, if you have to copy, I can give you two minutes to do so. I can repeat this. But I will appreciate if you remember it for your lifetime. That what is, when we heat a liquid or even a solid, the heat supplied is used for increasing the temperature or the energy of the constituent particles. And then, they will they convert into vapors and start exerting pr uh, pressure on the liquid. And from the above, the atmosphere applies pressure on the liquid. So when this atmospheric pressure and vapor pr pressure equals, it the liquid boils. So do you want me to dictate the definition of boiling point or will you write it at your own? So we define boiling point is the temperature at which vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. Now, coming to the question, which will have higher boiling point, water or H2S? First of all, why this question is only for water and H2S? Reason being, both of them are hydrides of group 16, oxygen and sulfur. Both of them belong to group 16, right? When they react with hydrogen, this forms water. And then when, when hydrogen reacts with sulfur, it forms H2S. So we, what we mean to say or what we want to question here is that water has exceptionally high boiling point, whereas H2S does not. Right? Now, what is the explanation to this is 
that in case of water, the molecules have hydrogen bonds in between them. Ritika, does H2S has hydrogen bonds also? Yes, ma'am. H2S has hydrogen bonds also? It doesn't have. Okay. H2S, good. No hydrogen bonds. We said hydrogen bonds are possible only with fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and that too having hydrogen attached to them. Now, what we said, hydrogen bonds are weak, attractive forces. Now, let's mix and understand the concept. Then when we when we are, they, we have taken two containers. One is filled with water and another is filled with H2S. In this container, the water molecules, apart from having a normal force of attraction, are having additional force of attraction in the name of hydrogen bonds with them, right? If we talk about the molecules of H2S, there is no hydrogen bond. <coughs> if we, uh, what is a boiling point? At temperature at which vapor pressure must be equal to atmospheric pressure. That means you have to supply additional energy because you have to overcome this hydrogen bonds also only then they will be converting into uh, mole into separate molecules and reach to the surface or the top of the container so we must break hydrogen bonds to free the h2o molecules So therefore, you require more energy required. In case of uh, H2S, no hydrogen bond, no extra energy. Making sense to, uh, to all of you? Yes. Okay. And for your information, if you want to understand, the attractive forces existing between H2S molecules are known as dipole-dipole interaction, which are weaker than uh, hydrogen bonds. So I will again, this is one of the important questions. So I'm repeating myself that water has exceptionally high boiling point as compared to the other hydrides of group 16 because hydrogen bond is a comparatively stronger force of attraction. To make the water boil, it is uh, essential that the forces of attraction between the molecules are uh, broken up and they reach to the surface. So since we have to supply more energy, therefore they are uh, required to be heated for a longer time and therefore they are having higher boiling points, right? Now coming to the next question, which is related to the same thing, that water again, uh, both of them are group 16 element uh, compounds, water and H2S. Water is a liquid, whereas sulfur is a gas, uh, sorry. Let me correct it. Water is a liquid, whereas H2S is gas. We studied periodic table or we made periodic table so as to have a similarity or gradation in the properties. But now we are seeing, seeing some exceptions in it. What do we expect? We expect if water is liquid, H2S, H2S, uh, the and the rest of the hydrides of this group, H2SE, H2PO, all of them should, them should be liquid, but it does not happen. How do we account for it? How do we justify it? We justify it by saying what 
water has again the answer is hydrogen bonds which is a additional attractive force so what happens if you have two things if you apply more force on it what will happen they will come closer so if i can draw water molecules ki one was here another was here another was here another was here the moment hydrogen bonds are formed between them what will happen they will come closer the gaps between them will become smaller they will come closer that means what they may change from liquid state to solid state i believe this concept is clear to all of you from class 9 that in solid the particles constituent particles are very close to each other in liquid they are bit far out and in gaseous state they are very far out so at times they come very close to each other and the physical state changes from liquid to solid or gaseous to liquid is this point clear to all of you that why water is liquid and water and h2s is gas please respond so that i can proceed further the day to day example of this fact is in lies with lpg liquefied petroleum gas what happens here is it's not exactly hydrogen bonding but it is of example of a state change or the example of phase change we call it as in this case lpg is mainly methane now when you apply pressure on it the particles come closer from gaseous state it is changed into liquid state and it is moved to your home please don't uh, please always remember it is not a example of a hydrogen bonding it is an example of a phase change right in case of water phase is changing because of uh, the hydrogen bond the additional and a uh, stronger attractive force as compared to those existing between h2s and in case of lpg the state is changes because of uh, pressure is being applied on them is it clear ritika yes ma'am okay now similarly we will go we are coming back to the uh, original screen from where we picked up where we said boiling point of water is more than that of h2s water is liquid and h2s is gas i believe both of the points are clear to all of you now same thing boiling point of ammonia and phosphine why we have taken this example again they are member of group both the of them are members of can anybody tell me the group number they are they are p block element elements nitrogen and phosphorus group number please it's group 15 nitrogen phosphorus arsenic antimony etc right nitrogen being the first member of the group it forms since it is it has nitrogen uh, attached to hydrogen it forms hydrogen bonds and which is a additional attractive force uh, therefore it requires more energy to break and therefore boiling point of hydrogen bond 
ammonia is more than that of phosphine plus but please do remember as i told you sometime it leads to the change of phase from solid to liquid or liquid to gas in this case ammonia is gas and phosphine ph3 this is phosphine this is also a gas whereas in case of water and h2s you have seen the physical change in a state that is why in the beginning i told you that it is not necessary that physical state is always going to change it may change or it may not change but hydrogen bonding is definitely going to affect the boiling point and the solubility right now the last one the boiling point of hf and hcl you can do it now hf will have hydrogen bond because it has fluorine and hydrogen attached to it hcl does not have boiling point of amine i have just put it an example the details will be dealt in class 12 because class 11th and 12th syllabus are connected to each other this year also i will show you, you the question paper they have asked you the same question arrange these amines into the increasing order of their boiling points right so please uh, keep your uh, basics intact another major impact which it does is on the solubility before that let us do one more example that is of hard, uh, glycerol glycerol i am not too sure glycerol is used as a lubricating agent we can say or uh, used to retain the moisture on the body as you can see gluco uh, sorry glycerol has got three oh groups one two and three theoretically it can form six hydrogen bonds per molecule right so that means whenever glycerol dissolved in water is applied on the skin first of all it is harmless it's a uh, sort of a natural thing and it helps in uh, keeping your skin moistured in the, in the winter months with the chilly winds right and it is highly viscous viscous means having a consistency something closer to honey water if you pour it it will flow but honey and your cough syrup cough syrup flows but uh, less than water and honey if the if you have pure honey it is still flows less so such a liquids are called as viscous more the hydrogen bonds more will be the viscosity of course for the viscosity of different medicines uh, they may have uh, different reasons viscosity is always not the reason for them right so that is few things about glycerol moving on to solubility we must remember anything which have which can form hydrogen bonds with water will be soluble in that's the golden line which we, you must understand and write it down anything which forms hydrogen bonds with water is soluble in it is it clear ritika yes ma'am okay so these are there are certain examples as we have seen orthonitrophenol salicylaldehyde salicylic acid they are able to form hydrogen bonds with it right so therefore they are going to be soluble in it between any two substances if you are asked if this is soluble this is not soluble please remember the answer has to be hydrogen bonding only right and if by chance if you have uh, biology in your as your subject you must have studied or you may be studying the structure of dna and rna earlier it used to be in class 10th if you have understood there 
So you will be seeing that, uh, or you must have seen that our proteins and the amino acids have many bases, like purine bases and pyrimidine bases, right? And they are held together by hydrogen bonds. Then ammonium salts are soluble in water. Ammonia in any form is soluble in water. That is the reason for having a, such a bad smell as you pass through a public urinal. Again, coming back to biology, uh, human beings are said to be aminotelic. Aminotelic means they, uh, they urinate, they, the waste product is amine, uh, ammonia. There can be, there are different elements which are uricotelic and there are many categories. Let's not go into that detail. Just understand that human beings excrete ammonia. And ammonia is highly soluble in water because it can form hydrogen bonds with it, right? So that is the reason whenever you have that particular bad smell of uh, urine, you need to put or flush out with it with a lot of water. Water will remove along with it. But this question is about the solubility of the ammonium and sodium salts. Sodium, as you know, since it cannot form hydrogen bond, it will not dissolve in water. Ammonium can form hydrogen bonds with water. Therefore, it will dissolve in it, right? This I have explained that water is a liquid, but H2S is a gas at room temperature. That this is an interesting question that alcohols have a higher boiling point than corresponding alkane and thiol explain. Th what is alkane? What is thiol? Do you know Shweta, Ritika and other students? This compound is called as alcohol. This compound is called as thiol. And this compound is alkane. Now with the formula and the structure, it becomes clear that it will be alcohol which will be forming hydrogen bonds, right? They will not form hydrogen bond and they will also not form any hydrogen bond. Therefore, alcohol will be having higher boiling point, higher solubility in water as compared to thiol and alkanes. Now, this also I have explained already. Glycerol is more viscous than ethane or anything. Ethane, if you want to know, we have, dis we have done this also C2H6 and glycerol as I told you it is trihydric alcohol. Trihydric means it is having three OH groups. Right? Now all these questions are same of same type but I have tried to put up as many questions as possible because it's, this concept is uh, important and it can be asked in the examination also. So methane and water have nearly same molecular mass, but methane's boiling point is less, whereas water is high. Again, the answer lies in uh, hydrogen bond. This is pretty difficult one, chloral hydrate, but based is on the same, con uh, same concept of hydrogen bond. So please be aware that where you get hydrogen bond and where you do not get the hydrogen bond, right? It is, of course, of the competition level question, but uh, it is just here to make you understand that this, uh, this is important, right? So, to end this topic, let's have a simple question. Quickly respond to this question. Which of the following does not form hydrogen bonding?
Any answer, Shweta? Um, HCl doesn't have a hydrogen bond. Correct. See, rest, even otherwise, we should be knowing it. Ke, uh, the reason being, we have discussed HF, water, and ammonia. These are the three basic examples which we have done in the class. So, HCl is the obvious answer. Now, from my side, we, have, uh, we are at the end of this question. First of all, I like Ritika to tell me, is there any issue in this chapter? If we plan a test next week, will you be able to give the test? Yes, ma'am. I understood the lesson. In this chapter? Yeah, in this chapter. I'm just asking. We need to check, check with the admin and the other staff. But I just see, since the chapter is very important and chapter is very long. So, this week, with, uh, uh yeah, Shweta, please speak. Are you going to... I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Are we going to keep the test this week? No, maybe this week, whenever we have. Uh, first of all, do you have any issues with this chapter? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I was asking this question. See, earlier when we finished periodic classification, it was a pretty small chapter. And this one is a pretty big chapter. So if you have uh, your exams or a periodic test, whatever is scheduled there, uh, you can always tell me so that uh, you perform good in this. You get an adequate time to uh, revise all the concepts and uh, then proceed further for the exam for the test, right? Because for for me the tests are just not for uh, um I say monotonous thing. They need to be enjoyed, right? So we have done VSCPR, we have done sigma pi concept, we have done different orbitals filling of electrons in molecules, right? So with that, we end this chapter and now we will pick up one chapter from the second book. The reason for picking that particular chapter is that this chapter is related to the chemical bonding and organic chemistry, some basic concepts are related to each other in terms of chemical bonding, in terms of uh, the question. See, the question comes, how many sigma bonds are there in benzene or ethene? So unless or until I tell you what is benzene, what is ethene, I cannot ask you that question. So and most important thing about this particular chapter is that uh, Many questions of 11th class and 12th class come in the exam from this particular chapter the which I am referring. And another reason, class 12th organic chemistry has total of 34 marks. And these 34 marks, believe me, are uh, require a lot of labor. Labor, not in the terms of physical labor, labor in the terms of a mental strength and the revision and recapping many a times, right? So we must understand the basics and uh, we must, if we start doing it first, and uh, then only we will be able to finish this chapter in time. And whenever the rules are applied, there has to be a compound. And most of the time you have to, uh, this year, you have to talk about or discuss about the organic compound. Because earlier we used to have a chapter named as S block elements and P block elements. So if I have to give the example, it was easy for me as a teacher to give you an example for that. But this year, these chapters are deleted from your syllabus. So I'm left only with the examples from organic chemistry. I have to tell you the rule and I have to make you understand and apply on something. So therefore, I'm picking this particular chapter. To begin it, uh, we say there are certain things known as physical sciences. Physical science includes physics and chemistry. Physics uh, talks about laws which are applied to it. How does any change uh, in the physical atmosphere or how does uh, they behave in the physical world? Chemistry talks about the, what happens inside an atom, right? 
nobody is going to ask the definition. Don't worry about it. But organic chemistry, of course, there is a relevant point which may be asked. So we say chemistry is divided into two, rather four basic uh, categories. One is called as organic, inorganic, physical, and analytical. Talking about the physical chemistry. In physical chemistry, we uh, listen or we understand about the concepts of equilibrium, thermodynamics, that is effect of heat, temperature, pressure, etc. on the various systems. Gaseous state, how do gases behave? Similarly, the solid state, liquid state, we talk about their rules and their behavior, their structures. Inorganic chemistry, can Ritika define what, what do you understand by the term inorganic chemistry? Um, like inorganic chemistry deals uh, with the uh, structure, like uh, the what's inside the atom or nuclei, things like that, the protons, neutrons, electrons. And uh, like organic chemistry deals with the uh, chemicals and all. Okay. Shweta, do you agree with the Ritika or you want to add something to it? You are the difference between Yeah, what do you understand by this? What is written on the screen, Shweta? Physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, organic chemistry, analytical chemistry. Organic is like it deals with all the carbon compounds. Does it? I didn't get you. Can you please repeat, Shweta, and a bit louder? Organic chemistry contains all the um, carbon compounds. Correct. And inorganic chemistry contains everything apart the carbon compounds. Okay. See, in how organic much, chemistry, how there are... How many... Yeah, yeah, I'll... I'll uh, uh, more or less correct, I'll, I'll explain on it and I will uh, tell you the exceptions. There are certain, organic, certain carbon compounds which I studied in inorganic chemistry. Now, uh, coming back to another question. How many elements are we, do we know as of today? We did came uh, the periodic classification here recently. Please remember, we know the existence of 118 elements today. The all aspects of 117 elements, they are compounds. They are studied in inorganic chemistry, right? Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon and its compounds. Why such a special treatment given to carbon? The reason being number of carbon compounds is unlimited. Even today, we are discovering many, if not 100, 10, 20, 30 compounds of carbon are discovered every day. I can say that because uh, my PhD topic was synthetic medicinal chemistry. I happened to discover or synthesize a fluoroderivative of a compound known as pregnan. Pretty difficult to understand, but this compound has a commercial value. Right? It was tested on guinea pigs and found to be a con contraceptive. So therefore we can say the number of carbon compound itself is unlimited even today and it is ever growing. So the scientists thought for the ease of understanding, let it, under let it uh, be as a separate branch of chemistry, right? So in inorganic chemistry, we talk about 117 elements and their compounds, all types of properties, right? What is the what will be what will happen if they react with HCl? What how they are extracted? What is their physical state, solid, liquid, or gas? All those things come under inorganic chemistry. 
physical chemistry we talk about laws like thermodynamics that uh, what happens when you heat a system when you heat a gas what happens then the boyle's law pressure is proportional to volume charles law volume is proportional to temperature like that the different types of laws which are uh, developed by changing the atmosphere or the surroundings of a system right now there is organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon and its compounds except please remember this type of a question can be asked except for carbonates carbonates will have anion co3 2 2 minus carbonate then we have bicarbonates then we have cyanides we have alkyl cyanides and aryl cyanides also but hcn to be uh, precise kcn potassium cyanide that is studied in inorganic chemistry right that they are uh, studied under organic not under uh, organic chemistry reason being they are their properties are more closer to inorganic salts so please note it down so that we move ahead Have you noted down? Yes. Okay. What is analytical chemistry? Any idea? Okay, in analytical chemistry, we study about uh, the various in instrument. See, like scientists, uh, we know have gone to uh, moon. They might bring certain new compound. They might bring in certain new element from the from the dust there or the soil type of a thing over there or the rock over there. So, how will you analyze it? There are various instruments. Like uh, we have. Uh, infrared spectroscopy you have to have a big screen sort of a uh, structure and then you analyze the compound so analytical chemistry and a very miniature form of analytical chemistry which you do in your laboratory uh, have you been taken to laboratory in your school yes ma'am okay there you do analytical chemistry can be of two types uh, one is called called as qualitative and another will be quantitative so uh, what you have done in your laboratories can you tell me the name of any one experiment Have you done salt analysis? Yes, ma'am. And you must have been the you must have done uh, the titration. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now you are identifying the you are given a salt and you are asked to identify the which cation or which anion does it have, right? So that means what you are doing you are doing a qualitative analysis. 
you are finding the quality of that, uh, what type of a cation or anion is there in the salt, right? So that is called as qualitative analysis. What you do in titration is quantitative analysis. Am I correct or not? Do you find molarity, Shweta, or what do you do in the titration in the laboratory? We find the molarity. Molarity. Molarity is number of moles upon volume of solution in liters, right? So it is related to mass. Quantitatively, how many moles or how many grams are gone into that solution, right? So I believe it is clear what do we study in the four different branches of chemistry. We need to focus on organic chemistry. The reason for spending some time on it was that earlier definition of organic chemistry was not this. It was defined by a scientist in some other way. Therefore, to understand the newer perspective, it is important for us to know that what was the earlier perspective and how do we define organic chemistry in today's world right so the compounds in the earlier days let's say in the year 1780 i have taken this data from your ncrt book whatever they have mentioned if i re refer to iupac uh, site iupac i believe you have heard this uh, terminology or fact some of the teachers prefer to call it as iupac but i want to make a correction here that IUPAC should be read as IUPAC because it is an abbreviation of the word International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. Or sometimes it is said as International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So they have given a different date. They have talked about 1770 on their site, but we have to follow NCRT. So on the basis of sources, they said there are certain things which we get for so, from soil, right? And they are like, we get milk from animal, we get vegetables from the plants, and we get mineral like uh, copper, silver, gold from soil. So on the basis of the source, they decided to segregate the compounds. They said that whatever is obtained from <clears throat> plant or animal source is will be called as organic, and whatever is obtained from soil will be called as inorganic or the mineral compounds. But, and there was a scientist, this is important. Bergelius has been asked many a times in the exams. Bergelius was a Swedish scientist. He said, for the synthesis of organic compound, a vital force is required, right? You must be knowing that when the digestion of food takes place, let's say glucose breaks down into many compounds. It means that our digestive system is capable of synthesizing many things. Uh, let's talk about uh, not so good example, like we develop stones at times. What is that? That is synthesis taking place inside our body. So Bergelius believed that a vital force, which can be provided only by the li uh, living body is important and essential for the synthesis of organic compound. But after a few years, that is in 1828, there was another scientist named as Wohler, W-O-H-L-E-R. What he did, he synthesized urea, NH2CO, NH2, as you can see on my screen, he synthesized ammonia in laboratory. That means and ammonia is an organic compound, right? So what does it mean? It means that organic compounds do not require any vital force. They can be synthesized outside our body also. Is it clear to everyone? So yes, the is, Okay, the key takeaway is that the vital force theory was given by Bergelius. That is the first key, uh, key takeaway for you or the first important thing for you. And the second important thing is Wohler, who opposed this idea by synthesizing urea, 
an organic compound in the laboratory from inorganic compound ammonium cyanate, right? This compound is ammonium cyanate. And it, the second compound to be prepared in the laboratory was acetic acid by Kolbe and then methane by Berthelot. These are the four or five scientists whose name you must remember. And this question that uh, acetic acid, after urea, name the compound which was prepared in the laboratory. And after that, these three compounds, you have to remember urea, acetic acid, and methane. Important from the perspective of the competitive exam or the competent learning as NEP says. They are to be remembered in that order only. Clear? You want to note down anything or done? Okay, let's move on to the next one. If I ask you one by one, how many sigma and pi bonds these two, these compounds have? Can you answer me? I believe all of you know that carbon is tetravalent. We discussed in the earlier chapter of uh, chemical bonding which we finished. That carbon is tetravalent in ethane, ethene and ethyne. We drew how many sigma and how many pi bonds it has. Now, coming to this compound. This compound is benzene, C6H6. Can you tell me how many sigma and pi bonds it has? Quickly find out the sigma and pi bonds. Ritika, can you count how many sigma and pi bonds are there in this benzene compound? Yes, one, one, six. Yeah, please count it quickly and tell me. Ritika, have you counted down sigma and pi bonds? Um, there are uh, three pi bonds. Okay. And um, 12 sigma bonds. Ritika, do you agree with Shweta or not? The first bond, this one is sigma. Sigma, this is pi, sigma, sigma, sigma. This is sigma, pi, sigma, 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 pi, sigma, sigma. So your answer is correct, uh, Shweta. It has 12 sigma and three pi bonds. This is also the structure of benzene as we have discussed earlier also. If the examiner gives you any one of these forms, you must have to draw the first one as I have given to you, right? It is important for us. We have to draw it like this only. Then we will be able to get the correct number of sigma and pi bonds. Let your syllabus be anything. If chemical bonding is coming in your, in your exam, they can ask benzene, right? It is not that benzene comes into the book too and in that particular chapter. Example of counting sigma pi bonds can be from here. Now, find out the sig total sigma and pi bonds in this compound.
first of all, draw the detailed structure. That is the key. Yaritika, how many pi bonds are there? Shweta, have you counted sigma and pi bonds? One. Okay, I'm waiting for two more minutes. Anyone got the answer? Thank you. 
Rithika, how many pi bonds can you see in this structure? Now I have drawn the structure completely. The trick was that you have to decipher or understand CH3 will also have three sigma bonds and there will be a sigma bond between oxygen and hydrogen, right? If you compare it with benzene, if you become, I say, pro into it, a professional into it, first thing is draw like this and then uh, find out how many sigma and pi bonds are there, right? So pi bond should remain same because there is uh, no double bond, extra double bond. They were already having 12 sigma bonds, right? Now what has happened? You have replaced two sigma bonds by C carbon-carbon uh, bond of CH3 and carbon-oxygen bond of the OH group. So if I take it that way, there will be, there are 12 already. To me, this will be the 13th. 14th and 15th bond and this will be the 16th one. Shweta, how many sigma you got? What happened, Shweta, Ritika? No response? One second, one second. Sorry. Okay. Are there 15? I don't know. Somehow I got 16. Can you count it here? Mom, for C -H Mom I also got 16. 16. Okay. Uh, just uh, good, Shweta and Ritika. Wh which one do you miss, uh, uh, Shweta? Why not count this um carbon-carbon double bond? No, no, that would have affected your pi bond con count. I'm talking mm -hmm. how many sigma are there? Mm -hmm. 16 more. Okay, good. So all of us are on the same page. Both all of us have got correct answer. Good work, right? So it has got 16 sigma and three pi bonds. Now coming to the next question. This I have taken as it is from, as it is from your NCRT book. They have asked for the hybridization and total number of sigma and pi bonds, right? Uh, will you be able to solve it or should I do it with you? I will do the first one for you. I have another compound, which should be a bit easier. So I will draw the CH. This is triple bond C. Then there has to be C H. Then double bond C H. C H three. Uh, is it clear to how I have drawn this? Clear, Ritika? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now then it becomes easy. This is carbon number one, two, three, four, and five. Sigma and pi bonds, we can count it from here itself, right? So I will say, I can see two pi bonds. And for sigma, I will say this is one, two, rather sorry, pi is three. I'm so sorry. Pi will be three. This is first, second, two sigma, third, four, 
फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट नाइन एंड देन दिस इज देंथ सिग्मा आई थिंक इट इज इट हैज गॉट टेंथ सिग्मा एंड थ्री पाई बॉन्ड डू यू एग्री श्वेता ऋतिका yes ma'am okay now they have asked for the hybridization in each case also what would you say for that the first carbon atom what will be the hybridization uh, shweta See for solving this part, uh, Ritika and Shweta, should I give you some time or should I solve it? Mom, you can solve it, Mom. Hmm. Just repeat, Shweta. Can you give us a clue? Yeah, I can give you a clue. See, uh, recall the concept of the sigma and pi bonds. Where is pi bond formed? you have to revise the concept for the time being i'm revising it for you self now that uh, pi bond is formed by on unhybridized p orbital right now what is the meaning of unhybridized p unhybridized p that is the is the one uh let's recall what was carbon's atomic number it was 6 1s2 2s2 2p2 we were drawing carbon in ground state as we drew 2s and we drew this is 2p and this is 2s we said it has got a paired electron here here and here then we said carbon is tetravalent so it must have four unpaired electrons so carbon in excited state should have 2s unpaired then 3 2p unpaired now it has to you have to find out how many sigma and how many pi bond each of the carbon atom is having if i look at the first carbon atom right what do i see the first carbon atom is this one it is having one sigma two sigma and two pi so the carbon number 1 has two sigma and two pi the presence of two pi means that there should be two p orbitals which are outside hybridization so therefore out of these four if i leave two p orbitals from hybridization what i will have i will have sp hybridization if i talk about the second carbon atom sorry uh, yeah this was the first one which was having two sigma the second one if i draw the structure of the second carbon atom let's go back go to the next uh, page it's too much of a hodgepodge here i will draw it like this and whenever i don't write hydrogen it means it is obviously there if i have written this is the second one this is the third one then we have double bond then we have ch3 i mean to say that uh, we have ch we have triple bond c then we have c and this carbon atom the third one has hydrogen attached to it right this one also has hydrogen attached to it now if i focus on this carbon atom what i can see the first carbon atom has got two sigma and two pi orbital 
so the two pi electrons rather so this will undergo sp hybridization this one is the first carbon this one is second carbon atom the second carbon atom also has two sigma and two sigma and two pi so this will undergo sp hybridization the third carbon atom it has got one two and three three sigma bonds are there in the third arc carbon atom three sigma one pi that means we have to leave out of we were having s p p and p and one pi bond will be formed here so what is left for hybridization that is sp2 if i talk about the fourth carbon atom this one again it is attached to one sigma the second sigma third sigma it is again attached to three sigma one pi hybridization will be sp2 talking about the last carbon atom the fifth one it has got five or uh, four sigma therefore it will be sp3 hybridization so uh, what is your doubt ritika Okay, since uh, Ritika is not is able to respond, let's uh, let me ask Shweta. Any doubts in this? Wait, um, how is it SP two? Which which one? For the fourth carbon, how is it SP two? Okay. Uh, See, we are talking about this carbon atom, right? If I draw this carbon atom, uh, what do I have? Uh, it is attached to one hydrogen atom. It is attached to a double bond on this side. And it is attached to another carbon like this. Is it clear uh, to you now, Shweta? Yes, yes sir. So this one is the sigma bond. This is the sigma and this is the sigma. So three sigma means only one p orbital is left from the hybridization. So this will be sp2. Yes, is it clear now? Yes. Sir. Got it? Okay. Uh, any other doubt in this one? Ritika, what, what, uh, is everything clear to you? Or you have a doubt yes, also? No. You have got the correct answer at your own? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, let's take this compound. The, uh, uh, let me put this one for you as your homework. Although it is typically easier than what we have done. Right? This one is for your homework. To find out the hybridization as well as a uh, sigma pi bond for each and every carbon atom. Before we end the class, so I think we can uh, have five more minutes of discussions. So let's talk about the how. <clears throat> how do we uh, represent the organic compounds? You must have seen sometimes we write uh, C2H6 in one way, sometimes we write it in another way. So what does what does it mean? What is it all about? So I can write C2H6 like this. I can write C2H6 like this. I can write uh, it like CH3, CH3. All of them are one and the same thing. So what are these technically called as? What does What do they mean and how to write them? Because again, it's a one mark question that write the bond line structure formula of this, write the condensed structural formula of that. So to understand it for once and all, 
let's understand them each one by one. The first one is complete structural formula. What is the expectation from this structural formula? It involves the all the uh, bonds which are formed. Right? It focuses on the electrons involved in bond formation. This we know single bond represented by a single dash, double bond by two dashes, and triple bond by three dashes. It's up to you whether you want to write the uh, lone pair on them or not. So this is this is the complete structural formula. By looking at this structure, you can find out how many sigma and pi bonds are there. Till now, we were doing uh, for finding the uh, structure of sigma and pi bonds in benzene and other compounds. We were drawing the complete structural formula. We don't know their name, its name, but we were just drawing that. And we said that it is not uh, necessary to show the lone pair of electron. Now, what is the meaning of heteroatoms? Organic compounds do contain oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, halogen at times, right? Like C6H5Cl, that is chlorobenzene. And uh, oxygen containing is uh, phenol. Nitrogen containing is amines. They may be looking too difficult or alien to you, but as we progress, they will also become like bread and butter to you. So like methanol, uh, methanol, meth means one, all means alcohol. A carbon compound having one carbon and OH group. So how do I get the structure or the formula of methanol is? I know meth means one carbon atom or OH means one OH group. Now rest of the valencies, carbon is tetravalent. I'll complete those valencies with the help of hydrogen. So I will write one H here, another here, and another here. So this will become CH3OH. In the complete structural formula, you can use either of them. You can write it like this, or you can write it like this, right? In the second structure, I have shown, or the, as per the instructions, we have shown the lone pair of electrons. Is it clear to all of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, moving to quickly to the next category. In this, what we do, we op uh, it is obtained by omitting some or all of the dashes. Dashes means the single bonds, right? Single bond or the double bond or the triple bond. So they are obtained by omitting some or all of the dashes representing covalent bonds by indicating the number of identical groups attached to an atom in the substrate, right? As you can see, in the complete structural formula, if somebody asked me to draw it for methane, what I should be doing? I should be writing it like this. CH3, CH3, CH3. At all six places, I have to write hydrogen. But in a condensed structural formula, what I can do? If to this first carbon atom, three hydrogens are attached. I'll put it as CH3 and another CH3. So that's how I got the condensed structural formula of ethane. For ethane, I just retained the double bond, right? C double bond C, H2, H2. Sometimes the students say, can I write it as CH2, double bond CH2? Uh, I'll say to an extent you can, but you should avoid doing so because hydrogen is monovalent. It will never form a double bond. So theoretically, it is incorrect, right? For writing CH, we just have to put a C triple bond C and then HH. Methanol, as you have seen, it was CH3OH. So what I have done, I have put these three or put all the three together in this form. Is it clear now? Now, the last point before we end the class, we'll take the other one in the next class. If I talk about this, CH3, CH2, 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 CH3 finally can be written as. In this compound, you can see CH2 is repeated many times. This is the first time. 
second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So what can be its condensed formula? We can write it as CH3, start a bracket, CH2, whole six, because you can see six CH2 groups and then CH3. Complete structural formula, ke liye, what you will have to do? You will draw CH3, CH21, CH22, CH33, CH24, CH25, CH26, and CH3. At every free end, put a hydrogen. It will take you a while to practice it, but I'll appreciate if all of you can start practicing. Right? You must start practicing them now. Writing hydrogen takes a while. I understand. But we have to. Right? I believe these two forms of a uh, structural formula or the representation of organic compound is clear to all of you. Right? So, any doubt, Shweta and Ritika? Any doubts? No, ma'am. Okay. So just, I believe you have noted down your homework. You will be telling me in the next class that how many sigma and pi bond and what is the hybridization in the next class. Right? So till then, happy learning. Have a good day. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Shweta, do you have to ask anything? I'm waiting for your response, Shweta. Okay, since I cannot hear you, I'm ending the class. Have a good day.